Hello and welcome along to the Unplugged Pod, where each week we explore everything to do with the world of switching off in a world that's always on. I'm David, a journalist, and alongside me is Hector Hughes, Mr. Unplugged himself. And this week we're joined by Maud Hurst. Maud is the founder of Energy Rise, who are making meditation accessible to all. She had a very successful career in acting and then gave it all up to focus on mindfulness. I hope you enjoy. Uh, well, Maud, uh, first of all, thanks very much for, for coming along today. Uh, just for historical reference, it was like a big storm last night. So this nice little golden sky morning after. So thanks for uh, sort of traipsing through the, the wet and the wild to get here. Much appreciated. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, Maud, what do you do to, to unplug? Uh, a few things. I mainly go into nature. So I kind of unplug from real world, plug back into nature. Um, and I also meditate a lot. Um, yeah, I think they're my two main unplugged. Do you do you meditate more now that you're running a meditation business? Yeah, because I'm te- teaching meditation <laughs> a lot of the day as well. So I generally, as I teach, feel like I get little plug-ins to meditation as well. But yeah, we all need lots of meditation at the moment, I think. And on that, on that uh, kind of going back to nature point, d- did you grow up in nature or... Grew up in the city. You grew up in Hackney. Didn't I you grew know? up in Hackney, so the where, opposite. Where of Hackney from? Farm, which I guess. Is yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it still around Hackney Farm? <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, I used absolutely. to love Hackney Farm. Um, I don't know. It's kind of been in my in the last few years that I've really, really realised yeah. that nature is so important. I think lockdown. I, already before that, I was travelling a lot and realising this like need. I think because I lived in the city, every time I looked anywhere, it was just like grey walls. And I suddenly <laughs> thought, and I've thought about it a lot recently, why nature is so important. And I think it's almost like when there's a grey wall in front of you, you just get caught in your own life and your own mind. And then you go into nature and you suddenly start realising there's something much bigger and you kind of opens your perception to to something bigger than, which is really good for the nervous system. Um, so yeah, I didn't get it from growing up, but I've just, <laughs> as I've got older, realised that, yeah, I need nature. I think there's always a fork with people that, grow up in cities you either completely double down you reject the country I'm a city (laughs) person until I die I'll just make it work or you kind of have that realization at some point maybe after your 20s that you're just like uh, yeah I need to get out of there which which camp are you are you a city um ah, I do (laughs) love a city I've lived lived in big cities like my whole life so uh yeah but I I think one day I'm sure the the, the (laughs) switch will flick and I'll go running into the hills somewhere. But I I am with you though. Still, I'm definitely Mm. a city person in like my soul, and I think like I have to still live in the city and be plugged into that because I like the the energy of it. But I just have to be able to get to the countryside and nature Mm. quite quickly as well. Yeah, I always think that obviously nature gives you something completely different. But like cities, you get a constant test of like reality constantly tests you every day. Like your interaction with someone, having a coffee, or how you deal with like a stressful situation. I don't know. It's uh, yeah, no, but but one day maybe. When you say nature, then would like where, where in England you go? Does it matter? Like, is it the beach? Is it the hills? Is it the countryside? Or kind of doesn't matter. I'm live. I live on the um, the start of Epping Forest, so I love being like in forest and in a forest like big enough so you feel like you can get lost and not really know where you are. But actually, being by the ocean is where I feel most calm. There's something I I believe that there's like a rhythm of nature that's just like it without trying in a way that like what I teach with meditation is always like two things that you want to slow down your pace because we're all like heightened the whole time um, and then also just breathe deeper. And I think like you go to nature and without trying, without putting any effort in, it happens Mm -hmm. because there's something I don't know if it is like a natural rhythm or something that you just tap into. And we all take a deep breath when we get to the ocean, weirdly, or when we get into trees. It's just like, oh, okay, I can breathe a little bit deeper. And so I feel like you're tapping into, into that naturally. Yeah, my um, my mum lives right next to Brighton Seafront. And like walking along that seafront, whether it's January or June, it always hits the same. Like it's, it, I always get that sense. Um, it's probably worth scratching back and giving a little bit of context more to, to you and your... Uh, you know, how you found yourself in the meditation space, because it's, it's kind of a, a bit of a segue from, from where you started in acting, correct? Yeah, completely. So I grew up, I mean, I was auditioning for stuff from when I was 10 years old. So I really was acting pretty much my whole life. Um, and then at, just as I was approaching my 30s, I came out of um, a big show, Vikings. And it had been amazing. I loved acting, but there was a part of me that didn't, I didn't feel like at that point in my life, I was being totally myself. And I went through a huge breakup, had to sell my house, 
And I was just left in this like big void of being like, what am I doing with my life? Um, and went on the very cliche yoga and meditation retreat. And um, my friend was like, come with me. I'm going to take you to this thing. And I'd never done any meditation or yoga at that point. And so I was like, okay, but gradually went and then had a, it was just a moment in that weekend where I was like, wow, I've, I've not actually stopped since I was 10 to be like, am I really happy? What is happiness at this point in my life? Who do I want to be at the age of 30 as I switch into this next kind of stage of my life? Um, And instead of kind of going into a really dark space, I kind of saw this like liberated experience where I was like, oh, I could, I can kind of reinvent myself at this point. And so deep dived into meditation, trained in yoga, um, and then went to a Vipassana 10 day silent meditation retreat, which was amazing. Um, and I just started realizing a whole new side of myself, which is like more, well, calmer, more authentically me, less afraid of the world. Um, I trusted my own opinions for the first time and everything started changing. I was like, we should be educated with this stuff from kid age. I don't know why it's not in schools. I could sort my own anxiety levels out. I, I could feel that like, yeah, instead of going to everybody else for answers, I'd go into myself So then I started teaching, then lockdown happened and I was like, the world is stuck at home wanting to meditate. And so I started my business and it's just been, yeah, going from there. Is there much of this in the acting world? Because it's obviously such a kind of high performance industry. Like, I guess when when you were doing Vikings, was much of... Was there much meditation yoga around? No, I mean, there probably was, not in the bubble that I was in. Um, Although I will say... LA now is always it seems to be at the forefront of wellness they always seem to be trying all new things slightly before the rest of the world um because everyone is kind of wild and crazy and living (laughs) on the edge and so now certainly I think there's a lot more of it most of my actor friends now are kind of tapped into some kind of practice or doing something to do with wellness um but when I was working it was very much like escapism was let's go out and get effed up and just like had a wild <laughs> time and like and it was it escapism was very unhealthy and was was that was it a hard decision because you, you walked away from you know a very successful acting career it, it sounds very obvious now did it feel obvious at the time I never made a really conscious definite choice to walk away um it kind of happened gradually and the healthier I I became in myself the less I felt pulled to it and I think a lot of the work I've done on myself in the last few years realizing that the reason I was acting in the first place was a lot about wanting and needing external validation and wanting people my parents divorced when I was a baby and I was um, very much like I want the world to love me and and so (laughs) acting was quite an obvious choice because you literally yeah yeah, yeah, absolutely um but every time you go into an audition like you're you're seeking that that approval and you get onto set and there's a kind of seeking of approval and the more successful you get the more approval approval you get and it was kind of a, a spiral for me that I, I loved part of it and the creativity of it I absolutely adored and, and do still miss. Um, but when I started finding meditation and started being able to connect to people in th- this way, I was like, it might have looked much more glamorous in the acting world, but I didn't feel glamorous inside. I felt like a little bit chaotic. And now it might not look very glamorous from the outside, but I feel like so glamorous inside because I actually know myself a little bit better. Love that. It, just back on that point about you know needing the world to love you like what was kind of driving you at 10 was was that a parent or, or was it you really determined to to make success of this at 10 I was just spotted by a casting director it kind of happened I was um doing gymnastics and a big casting director at the time was in the gymnastics place searching they were casting a film about a gymnast and so she, I started auditioning and then she would just get me in so when I was young mm. it was and unlike not deliberate decision at all um and then I was um diagnosed with dyslexia and I was like my sister and brother uh, are older and both of them are like genius both of them went into academia I mean really really and I was like oh gosh what am I going to do and so <laughs> acting became like my saving grace to kind of find my own voice I think as I grew up so it was never forced but I now look back and realize that I always yeah I did it for that validation I mean you know it's also a very like courageous thing to do, like being at the top of like a mountain, deciding to go down it and climb a completely different one, right? Like, did you get a few WhatsApps being like, "Are you are you sure are you sure about this more?" Because you're, you're doing okay as you are. Yeah, outside um, looking in at least. Yeah, I mean, particularly my family were just like, "What?" My mum was like, "Are you sh- are you sure about this?" Um, also, acting has a really weird 
thing that you know it feels everyone gets excited by it so like when you're around people and you meet people at parties you suddenly have a little bit of like you're like oh I'm an actor oh have you you know you've done anything I like and suddenly you're everyone's like oh I want to I want to hang around you and it was a bit of a shock to my ego to that like to now be you know I turn up to parties and I'm like oh I teach meditation and some people are kind of interested and some people are like okay goodbye <laughs> and, um so yeah it's been a, a a lot of people were like are you sure you actually want to start over and what if it doesn't turn into a successful thing what if it doesn't work but again it came back to me for the first time trusting my gut in this that like this felt like the right thing rather than I would have listened to those voices so strongly five years ago and probably wouldn't have given it a go but because I had meditation as this tool every time I felt shaken and was like is this the right thing is this not I just went into meditation I was like it feels like this is what I need to be doing so I kind of shut the noise out and just kept focused and I guess, I guess you've kind of won over your mum. So she's probably seen the change in you. Yeah, 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 hugely. I mean, she still doesn't meditate. She, <laughs> she's the, she does a bit of yoga now, but she's like, mm, meditation's not really for me. But um, Mums she sees don't it. tend to meditate, do they? No. Yeah, that true. generation. Could be changing. I don't know. Yeah, I think it is. I did. I went to an amazing retreat in Greece. I was teaching there a few weeks ago, um, and. I think there is a generation, the older generation, that was so kind of pushing it back that is slowly having moments and experiences that I think is changing it, but I'm not sure my mum's going to be that. <laughs> There's another, there. an interesting phrase you use there, which is uh, meditation is not for me, which your mum said. I think that that is one of the difficulties with meditation because for all the talk you hear about it, I think it's actually really hard to make it a habit and, and very few people do. And I think that's the narrative because there are so many different types of meditation as well. I mean, what, what do you kind of see that for people who think meditation is not for them? What, what would you say? that there are so many types and I think there's so many false beliefs beliefs around meditation firstly that it's a practice of being with a still mind so that if you are chaotic and anxious and have a lot going on that you can't ever do it because your mind's not quiet and realizing that actually that's not what meditation is at all meditation is just a practice of being with yourself with whatever's happening inside but giving yourself that space from the busyness of life to actually reflect on that and observe it um, so I think debunking some of the false beliefs around it is the first thing to realize that it's not um, it's not about being quiet in your mind already before you begin. And then secondly, to say, yeah, there's so many different kinds of practices. If it doesn't work for you with one kind and you're finding it re- like that you really struggle, try different practices, try different teachers. There's movement meditations, there's breathing meditations, there's intense breath work. Um, body scans there's so many different avenues so there's definitely going to be something for everybody so just don't give up at the first hurdle I, I would say and a lot of it I think is also not that I, people expect it to be perfect where they expect to sit down and meditate and just have a clear mind and then as you say and and then uh, <clears throat> when they get distracted then it's like, oh this obviously isn't working for me like it's a bit, but that's almost part of the process like I mean, you, you obviously meditate a lot now uh you must still find you get distracted during the sessions. Hundred you know, percent. That's almost the part of the game. Yeah. So when I first started training, because I my mind wandered loads and still does exactly as you say. It's called a practice because it it does consistently get easier, but it doesn't. You don't always sit with a quiet, quiet mind. It's like a wave. Some days are, are busy, some days are quiet. But when I first started training, I was very curious. I come from quite a science family that don't, aren't kind of spiritual and open to this stuff. So I worked with a neuroscientist because I was like, I just want some science to back, back up what I'm experiencing. And I was like, what happens in meditation? Does your mind stop, stop? Like, is there a chance that the thoughts just completely disappear? And she was saying that the neuroscience behind it is that the brain is obviously a thinking machine, so it doesn't ever stop. But it's in that process that you're discussing that you so you focus on something, whether it's breath, whether it's the guidance of the meditation, your mind is going to wander because it does, because it's that's what it's there for. And it's how quickly you can notice that you've wandered and bring it back to this focus point. Then that's what meditation is. It's in the circular motion rather than thinking I'm aiming for peace constantly. It's like, how quickly can I catch the mind Where did it go? Is it on my shopping list? Is it on my 50 emails I haven't responded to? But can I then just say, no, I actually, for this moment, just come back to the breath. And when I realized that it kind of freed, freed me to think like there isn't a right way to meditate. I can't get it wrong. It's just an an awareness practice. I love it. I I came across a really good tip the other day on that, which is when you realize that you've been distracted, our our usual narrative is to like kick ourselves. It's ah, I failed, but actually it's better to give yourself a pat on the back. It's like, oh, I caught it. You know, mm. I'm, I'm now back to the meditation. And so you, you kind of positively reinforce it rather than just get in the cycle. It's very easy just to spend 20 minutes sitting there, just 
in complete distraction than hating yourself because you got distracted and, 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 and that's obviously not productive. And so I think there is this kind of positive reinforcement of recognizing that, that is part of the process. I learned something called transcendental meditation, which mm-hmm. I'm sure you're very familiar with. Uh, and everyone who learns that is like four days, hour and a half a day. Uh, and the first day you get given your mantra, so you just repeat a meaningless mantra to yourself. And the next three days are literally, it's a group session, and you just go in and you tell them all the reasons why you think you're failing. And they're just like, don't worry, that's supposed to happen, that's supposed to happen. And you just have three days of that being drummed into you. And then you come out of it just like, you know, understanding that you're, you're doing the right thing. And I think that is really helpful. Yeah. Like, you know, you're not failing. Because it's so easy to talk ourselves out of it. I think that's what. Also in society, we're kind of built around that, right? It's like we don't, success has to be getting things right. And actually like, well, you know, the, the more you live life, you actually realize that your failures are so much a part of yeah. your successes because you have to fail at things to get them right. And meditation is the same thing. I think people go in with this intention of I'm getting it wrong if I don't come away from it feeling incredible and light and floaty. And actually like sometimes the really tough days when you've realized that your mind is like so hectic and you've got loads of stuff going, but you still manage to sit for 15 minutes like that's a real success because actually what you're doing is telling your mind even when you're chaotic I'm going to prioritize some stillness um yeah so I think failure is definitely part of it yeah I mean it's almost the whole like every success seems to be or you know just from my limited experience is just a lot of failures lumped together and every now and again they kind of add up to something good but that's it you're just failing like still i fail every day all day basically and then yeah. every now and again something goes the right way but you hopefully during the podcast that well <laughs> the amount of mistakes we made in the first six episodes yeah. what do you um obviously you guys are um you know you, you you've, you've made meditation your career and i know hector it's like a big part of your life as well what, what about people that say not just it's not for me the older generation people that say i, I don't have time for that like i've got two kids i've got a career my mum's ill i've got this i've got my hobbies my friends like I, d- I don't have time for for anything like that what would you say just the the smallest like entry point i mean you mentioned like 15 minutes or can you you know two minutes five minutes is, is that still worthwhile yeah five ten minutes is still worthwhile any moment of stillness is worthwhile and by the way that's what i hear most of the time i don't have time for meditation <laughs> but my experience is when i meditate i get 10 times more time in my day because i know how to prioritize i know what's important to me i've calmed myself from like waking up and grabbing my phone and then already trying to get all my emails done and rushing around and doing 15 things at once it like five i normally do 10 minutes minimum but that in the morning will set me up in a completely different way and and i normally get ideas in that morning 10 minutes that change the trajectory of my day so actually i've gained insight and time by doing it and I always say when we all we can all say we don't have time for anything but it's all about priority mm-hmm. and just when you've experienced it and you know that it helps it's not a struggle to prioritize it anymore because you realize that life is crazy without it <laughs> yeah and days are so long we, we spoke a couple of episodes ago just about how much of the day we waste you know mm-hmm. and you realize that when you start meditating of just how much time it's just it's just wasted and there's a great uh, jerry seinfeld i think it's him quote he, he's a meditator and he says, I meditate once a day unless I'm really busy and then I meditate twice a day. I'm like, that's the yeah, way to think yeah, about very it. very good. Yeah. Didn't know Seinfeld was into meditation as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, just on the, the acting mode, like if, if you'd have had, when you started your acting career, maybe not at 10, but like later into your teens and 20s, like if you'd have had the information, the knowledge and the meditation practice that you have now, do you think, do you think first of all, you still would have gone into acting? And do you, how do you think, if you had have gone into acting, how do you think meditation would have like helped or maybe hindered you like along the way in parallel? Interesting. I wonder if I would ever have, I probably would still have done it because I think it's taught me some amazing life lessons. Um, I really wish I had this during my acting career, just in terms of like helping with, with nerve, nervous energy, but before auditions and on set, like knowing that you can control your nervous system, um, would have been a game changer for me. Um, and also just like knowing myself through it. And so often in acting, your, the control feels out of your hand. You're a bit of a puppet and it's an amazing orchestra of, of different creatives coming together. But often you're told like, do this, stand here. And because I was young as well, I was just a yes person and I've, I've, definitely been a people pleaser most of my life and so I had just this yeah like yes mentality and I did a few things that I now would have been like no with meditation I would have definitely had a stronger a stronger sense of what was my right way to go about it so I wish I'd had it and I think those are the reasons that they would have it would have really helped me to just have a clearer sense of who I was in it because as acting in acting you're always being somebody else 
Um, and I didn't really have a strong sense of me in that. And I, now I think I would have. And j just on Energy Rise now, which you're, you're, you're now running, um, I first of all, would love to hear a bit about that in your own words. But, but also, I guess part of that is acting that you're being yourself, right? Like you're, you're doing a lot of the same skills. You know, you're, you're kind of talking people through meditations, coaching, et cetera, et cetera. So there must be a lot of the stuff you loved about acting that you can kind of take into that. But, but first of all, yeah, we'd love to hear about it. And, and by the way, I think we're all acting every day of our yeah, lives yeah, in different sure. roles. I think for we sure. play different roles in so many different like p aspects of our life. Um, but Energy Rise, um, yeah, was the kind of what, what came through all of this learning. And the whole ethos behind it is making meditation accessible um, in a world that feels particularly chaotic. There's so much busyness and we're all distracted by our phones all the time. I just felt like having a space where people could switch off, try lots of different modalities of meditation um, until they find something that works for them. And what was lovely about transitioning from my acting world was I, I had quite a big community behind me. And because Helga, my character, was kind of like a Viking hippie, it kind of transitioned quite nicely because <laughs> it wasn't like I went from, I don't know, like evil witch to like, a, a, it kind of, people kind of saw me as somebody that was kind of spiritual in, in my own way. So in a way, the, the journey has kind of continued and uh, it's been really beautiful because a lot of people that hadn't meditated have kind of come into the community. And so uh, Energy Rise is an online community. Um, we practice together four times a week, one yoga and, and three meditations and check-ins and just kind of share and connect as a community. But it's it's really global. It's lovely a mix of cultures. Um, and then I do retreats and festivals on top of that and run a meditation app. Love it. And what what kind of stage do people come to Energy Rise at? Like, are you is it people who meditate already or people who don't at all or a real mix a real mix and um, what's lovely is that it's a lot of people that haven't before so it, it's nice to be able to be the introductory practice for people to, to to and to as you were saying explain to people about the kind of the failures and it's going to not always be the easiest um and connect as a community but then lots of people that have meditated a lot that just want the consistency and practice I think you know what you were saying about how do people start actually having a community of people to do it with can be really helpful at first because we are all really busy um, and knowing that there's a space where there's a group of people that are intentionally sitting there to meditate sometimes makes you stick at it a little bit more than doing it by yourself. But just like I guess there's a question for both of you because you both run companies that um you know, you both run companies that are very much to do with, with switching everything off, right? But how, how do you balance the fact that it's 2023, clearly you have to advertise, market, you have to have an Instagram, a TikTok or whatever. Like, how, how do you balance those two things with, um, you know, the, the core fundamental of both your companies is, 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 you know, going inside a bit more alongside what you actually just have to do? I mean, how, how does that seesaw work? It's a struggle, if have I'm totally TikTok, honest. I don't understand okay. TikTok. I okay. have one because somebody told me to, and then I'm like, I think every time I post, it's like, 100 likes. I'm like, I don't know what this platform is, and maybe it's not my age group, or just tech is not my friend sometimes. Um, but Instagram very much is a part of, of my world to be able to access people. I think the way I balance it is just by giving it like dedicated times in my day to be like okay so this is the time I'm, I'm online a lot I because also I teach online mm -hmm. as well so realizing that and then also to be able to recognize that I, I I need time to switch off so just knowing and dedicating time for nothingness I'm actually writing an article about this today but when life gets the most chaotic it's when you need to switch off the most and I'm I did a research paper recently and did lots of um looking into the science of what happens in the brain when we're in our analytical mind our creative side of the mind switches off you can't access them both at the same time so when we're always busy and we're doing the marketing and we're doing our emails your, your creativity for new ideas just isn't isn't there so you have to dedicate big chunks of time to nothingness meaning no screens maybe just walking in nature or meditating to actually let new ideas come and when you're running a business if there's no room for new ideas it doesn't develop it doesn't evolve and um, so my balance is just knowing that there are times and it doesn't always work out sometimes I get totally caught up in the doing of things but also to know that a, a few times a week I have to have time for nothing yeah I love that I'm, I'm a, as you know a big advocate of that as well I think so much of again so much of the time with any business you're almost pulling in the wrong direction then you have these insights you're like oh god you know why am I doing all of this I should be doing this and you need you need space to get there you know and I think uh like so so much of the business like every business is almost a manifestation of how you the, the founder and the team kind of see the world mm. 
And so working on your model of how you understand the situation and as the business grows and you know, there are more things happening, then the complexity is growing as well. And it's, it's harder and harder to kind of see the, the forest for the trees, you know, and it, you, it's so easy to get caught up. And you know, it's the, the irony, we've spoken about this before, but the irony of running a kind of well-being business mm. uh, and, you know, it's, I think probably we're fairly similar in, in some sense, whereas actually like what got me to this business is that I was bad, you know, I was kind of addicted to my phone and, and kind of easily distracted and all of these things. And so I think people probably see, you know, hear us talking now and think that we're just spending all day meditating under trees and <laughs> everything's really easy. It's obviously not like that. That's my impression of you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, what is really helpful, and I'm, I'm sure you see this more, but certainly for me, uh, is you see it working and the more the more you do, the more time you spend offline, the more you meditate, uh, it just gives you this kind of inner conviction that it does get the results because you're basically breaking the narrative that, I mean, you know, especially in the, the kind of tech startup world that I came from, the narrative is you have to work 12 hour days. You know, if you want to be a success, you have to work seven days a week and it works for some people, you know, like you've got the Elon Musk of the world who are driven by something different. And, you know, maybe if you want to get to Mars in the next 10 years, that's what you've got to do. But I think you can still build a you know, wonderful business, uh, coming from a different place, coming from a place, place of, you know, just like joy and like genuine uh, desire to make a positive change in the world. And with that, you know, I, I really think that it's about helping yourself. So you can either have these businesses driven by trauma and you need that chip on your shoulder. Uh, a successful CEO I spoke to recently said to me, he kind of uncovered some trauma with his parents. He's like, but I don't want to solve it because I want to take this into my next business. <laughs> <laughs> That's driving that. Um, but I think also like you want to help yourself so you can help others. And that, you know, for example, what I'm trying to focus more and more on now is like my number one priority is to turn up to be like a calm and positive influence for everyone else in the team who are doing the real work. I mean, you know, really like unplugged right now, uh, a lot of people are doing much more than me. And so I just want to be there and like support them and, and kind of be in a good frame of mind to make good decisions and, and be a positive influence. So yeah, I think it's, it's massive. Yeah, I remember as well, actually, Hector, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you sent an email out like a year ago to the unplugged uh, like investors or people that are on the email list. And you, you said, oh, we need someone that can deal with the TikTok. But I could see even in the way you wrote it or someone in your team wrote it, there was like an inner conflict there. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember this, but you're like, oh, we need someone's younger brother to sort our TikTok out. Yeah, like, yeah. We're almost, not we're too good for it, but you know what I mean? Like, we know we shouldn't be doing this, but... We have to do this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one. So I, I, I shouldn't be doing yeah, this, but you know what I mean. I've definitely had that conflict before, but actually I think having, I mean, our, our the core of our uh, marketing strategy is social media and it is important. So like the more I see it working, you kind of got to look at the expected value. So are we, is us putting out more content worsening people's you know addiction, improving? Uh, kind of reducing their quality of life or is it actually giving them a trigger of oh man maybe I should go and spend three nights in a cabin and uh, you know in the countryside and so I think it's important to be there you know like to take an extreme example uh, in casinos you have the are you gambling too much signs on the cash machine right because you've got to go where where the people who really need to see it are so I think it is like you know I, I feel like you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot sometimes. It's like, oh, we're not going to do this um, because of our principles, etc. And the expected value to the world ends up being less, you know? Yeah. So like there are people, I think there are people who take the uh, whole environmental stance too far to an extent. Like I have a friend who is a super, super moral guy, amazing person, but he's so devastated by what we're doing to the planet that he's completely immobilized, you know? And he could do so much good if he just, you know, accepted it a little bit more and just went out and really kind of rolled up his sleeves and got stuck in, I'm sure he'll get there at some stage. But right now he's just so like determined not to like, you know, step on any bugs or uh, throw away any rubbish or whatever it is yeah. that, that he's kind of not engaging with the world at all. So I think you have to go out there. You have to engage with these channels and get to people where they can see this message. So I, I, I do think now it's really important. Although I was conflicted at the start. Yeah. I feel that confliction for sure. But the truth is, everybody's on their phones scrolling all the time. So you're either present there or or you're not. And people will either see you or, or they're not. So you do have to have some in on it, I think. Well, it also might be worth mentioning that you've stayed at um, 
the unplugged cabins before. Loved it, or okay. what? You know, what, what was the what was your hated takeaway it. from that? Um, <laughs> absolutely hated. It. I have stayed quite a few times. Um, it really is my favourite getaway. Um, I it's very rare that you go somewhere where you're encouraged to put everything away. <laughs> um, and in fact, in the first time that um, I went, we got there and my partner was like, where's the plug? And I was like, <laughs> um, <laughs> here's the thing. Um, so uh, yeah, it just is. Um, we actually ended up getting engaged there last year. <laughs> so good. My favorite. Um, because of that, because there was no, there's nowhere else. I, I travel a lot for, for work and I, I'm, I'm often very fortunate to stay in beautiful places but we both always say when we left the cabins we felt our most calm our most connected conversation just happens in a deeper way when there's no distraction and also surrounded by nature I think that helps as well um but yeah so we ended up getting engaged there and now it has a very special place in our hearts love that the uh, relationships have been the bigger surprise for us I think when we started this just assumed it would be mostly people going on their own and journaling and reading, etc. We obviously get a bit of that, but but actually, the the real kind of uh, use case and, and uh, positive influence has been on couples because most couples who have been together for less than a decade probably haven't spent a day together without their phones. And there's some amazing research that just having your phone switched off on the table reduces empathy between two people. You know, it doesn't need to be on, but it's pulling some of your attention, which is attention that's not going towards that other person. So it's, yeah, it's quite profound and surprising what it what it can do. Hugely. Like really, really is. And, and also just like going for adventures when you don't have, you have a, a, literally a map to look at. And I was like, <laughs> wow, it's like, it's so weird how this was all we had when I was little. And actually all of a sudden there's, I have this complete dependence on this device for all aspects of my life and actually stripping that away. And even in conversations when we're at the cabins and, and figuring out that we can't solve everything in two minutes because we don't have Google to get to and answer the question and just having to sit and, and actually like really think about things in different ways. I was like, our, our attention span has got so short and I think that's what it does. It just allows for your attention span to to, lo- to lengthen again. Um, yeah, and connection. So much of what I do is about connecting to people, but, but I just feel that that does something. The unplugged place just gives you a sense of a deepening of connection back into nature, to yourself and to whoever you're with as well. So you've had a, an engagement in the cabin, Hector. Many breakups or do you just not hear about those? In like, I'm uh, sure we've had some breakups. Yeah. <laughs> just don't, don't get that on the feedback. We yeah, don't hear quite as well. We do sometimes. Yeah, you know, Honestly, people pour their heart out on this. We, we have a pre-stay and a post-stay survey and, yeah, all sorts of stories in there so uh but yeah lots of engagements uh definitely a few breakups as well because it, it's it's almost a litmus test yeah, I can, yeah for yeah. sure i can see that and sometimes you know couples will go and they'll just really have a blazing row one day and then actually that's a catalyst to kind of really strengthen and so sometimes there's just something in there some resentment or something that needs to come out and it's just the environment to do that so i'm sure there's all sorts we don't know about mm-hmm. as well just a slight tangent while we're here hector i noticed that um because the cabins, as you said, initially you thought it would be like yeah, individual people maybe going and then like it morphed into couples. Uh, notice now you've created cabins for three people. Is that right? Or you're on the verge of doing so? Yeah, we d- just launched the first uh, three-person cabin basically with an extra bed. It's our easily our most requested okay. feature. So something slightly different, obviously bring a child, a friend, whatever it might be. So we'll see how that one goes. I think, uh, yeah, the, just been blown away by the kind of uh, range of people who want to do this. So want to make sure we stay... Uh, focused on the core customers because you can't be everything to anyone but also just adding that in to, to see how that goes the third person sleeping on the floor or like you re- they, they, they've even got a bed okay, okay no. <laughs> i love that i can imagine going with like two friends actually sure, and yeah. having a really beautiful time with friends friends there as well and just bring it back to energy rise like how how do you see that progressing over the next months years Trying to reach more people that maybe haven't meditated before. So um, a big thing I'm working on at the moment is getting into the corporate world because I think um, a lot of people really need it in that very kind of rat race, fast paced life. Um, And so creating a a workplace retreat um, with my friend Ellie and and we're going to, yeah, trying to get into bringing this stuff and also to, yeah, realizing people don't have to go for whole kind of weeks to change their life you can just implement little bits and so trying to get out to as many people through the corporate space i'd love the community to just keep growing and growing um on my online community and at some point putting more love into my app so that can grow as well so more of the same just reaching as many people as i can to get meditation on the forefront of people's minds 
And where, where do you see the future for meditation? Do, do you think we can get to a stage where everyone meditates? I think the younger generations, it could happen. I'm not sure our generation is <laughs> going to get there, but I do see a future where I mean, health is already, already so much a part of people's knowledge. My um, partner works for um, Diageo, and so he works in the, in the booze industry. And apparently 25% of 18-year-olds are, are not drinking wow. anymore mm-hmm. and are not interested in that. And so if that's part of what's happening, and you know, and we all know that you know, 18 to 25 was just, maybe it wasn't for you, but for me it was just such a kind of like wild time of experimenting. And if it's not, going into like partying I think it is going to go into wellness and and people being really engaged in in how they can kind of better themselves and in a kind of well wellness aspect so I do I do see it slowly trickling into education and then that will change that everyone will kind of know about it I hope and do do you do many retreats outside of your own work like you do do you go and I guess it's almost market research to some extent I go, I do, I, I teach a lot on other people's retreats. Okay. So I go, yeah. I travel and, and kind of in, immerse myself. If I'm honest, I, I haven't really been on many of my own, like me switching <laughs> off retreats for a while. And I, when I did Vipassana, the 10 day silent retreat years ago, I left saying, I'm never going to do that again. Yeah, it, was it, it was brilliant, yeah. but it was hard. And now I already feel an inkling that that's, I need to do that again. And that there's a calling for me to kind of go and deep dive into my own retreats. Um, I love retreats. I think they're such an important part of reconnecting to yourself. And how do, you, how do you, I guess, develop your teaching? Is, is it just kind of learning by insight in your own meditation? Like, are, you, are you just kind of coming up with stuff as, as you go? Yeah, I work completely intuitively. Um, this is going to sound cliche, but I'm going to say it because it feels true to me that <laughs> when I first started meditating, I really clearly felt like this is what I was always supposed to do. I feel like there's a... When I close my eyes and when I get into a meditative state, I don't actually know really what I say. I just, whatever comes intuitively seems okay. to work and it seems to resonate with people that are that are in my communities. Um, so yeah, I meditate a lot by myself. I get a lot of insight through my own meditations um, and in spending lots of time in nature and, and I kind of get feelings of what I need to do and how I develop my, my work. And the lovely thing about meditation is you keep learning. The more you meditate, it's like you go to a class every day because you're 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 understanding your own struggles your own failures and then you can teach that in your next class and we all our brains are very different and wired differently but at the same time there's a lot of similarities between all of us and so what what's my struggle what's your struggle they they, they'll be resonance with all of it um so yeah I kind of my own practice develops through the more I do and then my teaching develops through that as well what's uh what's a recent kind of learning insight or something you've changed your mind on um a recent insight for me is just the last few weeks have been so crazy and chaotic um, and just the importance of doing nothingness. I think um, I go through different stages of what I want, to, like how I meditate. And a lot of the time I, I use music. A lot of the time I use breath work. And at the moment I'm really craving just like what happens if you don't plan any of it and you just sit in silence and be Mm. Um, I love the phrase that we're human beings, not human doings. And we live most of the time in the doing. Um, and so coming back to a place where like, there's no guidance, there's no music, there's nothing. Like, what if you just close your eyes and see what happens? So I'm kind of in that phase and that's spilling out into my teaching as well. Obviously you've done, um, you, you know, you mentioned a 10 day silent meditation retreat and Hector, you've, you've done, um, done similar. I mean, what a question for both of you, I guess, is like, what's the most, profound moment you've had during those 10 days or, or during meditation at large so in the 10 day vipassana um it was probably day six it's you literally sit for 10 hours a day meditating on and off you kind of sit for an hour and then sit for two hours and it's re- it can be really physically uncomfortable you definitely start knowing your own escape like your own mind workings this is what happens and then day six i had this really bad pain in my hip and I was like oh god I don't want to sit in this and I just kept sitting and then eventually a memory popped up and it was like from when I was four and I sat with the memory and as soon as I'd like sat with that feeling uh the pain went and I was like wow I think it was this amazing aware, um, realization of how our mind body connection is so into- integrated and we don't often understand that um, and to realizing that even some of our physical pain is actually emotional pain and um, when we sit for longer periods of time, you start realizing that your body is just this brilliant machine that holds things in different ways. And meditation can be this incredible uh, moment where it can you can release physical and emotional stuff by just sitting. For me, that was a pretty profound realization. Mm. Love it. I uh, did my first Vipassana earlier this year, first and only. Um, and it was it, I found it tough, to be honest. I'd previously done what I would call a Vipassana light. It was like a half 
uh, meditation, half Buddhist philosophy. And I came out of that one. It was like the right retreat at the right time in life. I came out of that with just so much like joy, compassion. So I went into this with sky high expectations and it was tough. Like, mm. Yeah, 10 hours a day meditating, quite a lot of health stuff coming up as well. But I did have one, uh, one thing that's really stayed with me, which is the, so about, yeah, about three or four days in, they start something called strong determination, which is where you sit for one hour, uh, three times a day and you can't, you're not supposed to move a muscle. So you have to stay completely in your posture. Whereas the rest of the time, you know, you're on the mat for 10 hours, but you can kind of move around and that, you know, that they say some stuff at the start and then you're, you're just waiting basically for it to finish. Obviously you're not supposed to be waiting. So at the start I, I kept being like, Oh my gosh, you know, when's this going to end? Think your head, etc. And then after doing it a few times, I, my brain suddenly made the jump to, well, at some point this will end. And then it was like, and actually, and then we'll get through the meditation this afternoon and then it'll be the evening. We'll have the talk. I'll go to bed and then it'll be the next day. And then we'll get to the end of the retreat and then I'll be on holiday in a couple of weeks time. And then the summer will come and we'll be growing with unplugged and it'll be the end of the year. And then, you know, unplugged will grow and we'll keep working on that. And then at some point I'll have a family that will all happen. And then I just really kind of clearly saw myself. Uh, the towards the end of life looked happy and peaceful and just thought and, and someday I will die and that in that moment I just had complete peace because I think what Vipassana teaches you is just that everything passes everything changes and you know it will all be gone uh, in, a, in a moment you know that's how it will seem at the end so that has really stayed with me and through the, the rest of the retreat that, that kept kind of popping up and it just really gave me a, a sense of calm like there's a reason that all of the re religions or stoicism or, or whatever else they all meditate on death because i mean if you can make peace with that then everything else is a, a detail yeah and this is um a bit different i guess but like is there anything obviously you guys have, have spoken a lot about the the positives of meditation and that's like it's um it's really clear like is there anything that you think is like a negative aspect of meditation is there anything that you think like you know, for, I'm just thinking of some healthy practices, let's say like the gym, someone can get too obsessed by it and they go the other end, right? Is there anything about meditation that you think, oh, that aspect's actually not healthy or that's too extreme or anything like that? I mean, I think anything can be, you can get too obsessed with it, but, but actually I don't think there's anything unhealthy because ultimately, I mean, I think people could completely disengage from life if they get really into it, but is that a bad thing? I, I don't know. It's, you know, I think... It, the lovely thing about meditation that I've found of all the things that I've done and, and when I first jump, jumped into this world I, I did um, an ayahuasca retreat in Peru and I think there's many things that you can do which is you know taking something outside of you and putting it in that can that could lead to something unhealthy but with meditation it's just you being with yourself and I don't think that there can be a negative outcome to that mm. one one area I think it can I agree with all of that and but one area I think it can go wrong is there's a, a wonderful phrase which is spiritual superiority. Mm. And it's when yeah. people get caught, because the whole point of meditation is basically the suppression of ego. You know, you, you're kind of quietening the ego, which which causes so many of our problems and, uh, you know, frustrations, etc. And sometimes it can go the other way where people see themselves as better because they meditate. Mm. I'm better because I'm spiritual, you know? And I think that is easily done, you know? But actually that's just doing it. You can, you, you, know, you can go to the gym and, try and lift something the wrong way and, and do your back out. So it's, I think, done right. It's just a, a real gift and a, a force for good. Uh, but as with everything, you can you can get it wrong too. All right, that's a nice uh, nice wrap. A lovely little 45 minutes. More to, why don't you um, tell everyone where they can find you and what their best kind of entry point is to being part of your community? So my website is mordhurst.co.uk, super easy. Everything is on there from my app, my uh, community, which is called the Members Club for the Mind. Um, I'm going to be going into the corporate space. So if anybody wants me to come into their corporate world, please get in touch. Um, and Instagram is just mordhurst. That's where everything is. And where, where can they read your writing? Is that on, on your website? Or? My website is there and um, I'm uh, in magazines, but kind of dotted around, but on my website as well. Great stuff. Oh, I was, I was sorry. Yeah, no, go just before we finish, I was going to ask... Have any of your fans from um, acting like come across to, to be part of your community? I guess that was a, a decent chunk of everyone at first. That must have been quite an interesting evolution. That yeah. You took them from acting to, <laughs> into part of your, uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't actually realise 
at first it was in one of my first in-person retreats that I ran that I was like how did everybody like connect into the community and they're like oh and I was like oh okay well again you got to look back and think like I'm so grateful that I had the yeah. experience to be in a show that had a huge reach because that I can reach people that would never maybe have meditated before uh, but yeah it's definitely there's definitely been a little transition over and occasionally when I open free sessions I get some crazy <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always like mute mute that um, it, it still happens occasionally but um yeah small price to buy should get anyone tidy up in costume as a, as a full viking i haven't yet but no, i did no. when I was... my dears, <laughs> yeah exactly i did used to do a few comic cons and uh, some of the costume people oh, wow, go yeah, full yeah. out yeah <laughs> lovely stuff wonderful right. well, thank you so much for coming a, a real joy thank you for having me really nice.